First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. I am a social worker here in Pittsburgh, and I met Paul LeBlanc organizing alongside each other in a local to us organization called Pittsburgh Green New Deal. And we organize around environmental justice issues for our region. I'm also active in the fight for reproductive justice with an organization called Tri-State Abortion Action, fighting to defend and expand abortion access in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio. And I also helped to organize a, uni a union alongside my coworkers with the United Library Workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. On behalf of Haymarket Books and Pluto Press, I would like to welcome you to this forum, which is also a book launch for a new study entitled Lenin, Responding to Catastrophe, Forging Revolution. Here's the book. The publisher of the book is Pluto Press, and the book's author is an acclaimed scholar of labor and socialist history, Paul LeBlanc. Over the last century, the legacy of Russian revolutionary leader Vladimir Lenin has been fiercely contested. It is being reevaluated now in our own time of crisis and catastrophe on the 100th anniversary of Lenin's death in 1924. Our forum will use this book as a starting point for a discussion which we hope will be a part of that reevaluation. Like the book itself, our speakers will give attention to the democratic perspectives and collective struggles behind much of Lenin's political thought and also to Lenin's relevance for the developing struggles of today and tomorrow. We look forward to some of you sharing questions and brief comments in the live stream, which will help enrich our discussion. I will start by brief, briefly introducing our panelists in the order in which they will be speaking. Then we will get right into the presentations and the discussion. At the forum's conclusion, speaking in reverse order, each of our panelists will have a few minutes for closing remarks. So first I'd like to introduce Paul LeBlanc, who is a longtime activist in the socialist, labor, anti-racist, anti-war and environmental movements. And he is Professor Emeritus of History at La Roche University in Pittsburgh. In addition to the book we are looking at in this forum, he has produced such widely read studies as Lenin and the Revolutionary Party, From Marx to Gramsci, a short history of the U.S. working class, and many more. We'll also hear from Jody Dean, who is also active in the socialist movement and is a political theorist and professor in the political science department at Hobart and William Smith Colleges in New York State. She has also held the position of Emeritus Professor of the Humanities in the Faculty and Philosophy and she is an author and editor of 13 books, including Democracy and Other Neoliberal Fantasies, The Communist Horizon, Crowds and Party, and Comrade, an essay on political belonging. I'll also introduce Linda Lowe, who has been a devoted activist over the decades to being a practical political organizer, organizer particularly in the socialist, feminist, and trade union movements. Among the groups in which she has played an active role are the Illinois Single Payer Coalition, Jewish Voices for Peace, and especially in recent months, Chicago for Abortion Rights. Lastly, I'd like to introduce Cliff Connolly, who is a member of Democratic Socialists of America and also of the Marxist Unity Group, which seeks to function as a constructive faction in DSA, working to help that organization move in a more revolutionary direction. He is a contributor to Cosmonaut, a Marxist magazine seeking to help develop revolutionary strategy, historical analyses, and modern political, social, and cultural critiques. Among the articles he has written for Cosmonaut is a sympathetic but critical review of Paula Blanc's new book on Lenin. Without any further delay, we'll be start starting our forum by hearing remarks from Paul. Thank you. 
thanks, Julia, and thanks for all of you being uh, involved in this forum and for all of you out there in television land uh, participating <laughs> in uh, our collective uh, consideration of these items. Um, what follows is drawn from the prologue and epilogue of my book. Lenin lived over a century ago. How could he possibly be relevant to our own times? In the 21st century, the people on planet Earth live in wondrous times indeed. At our fingertips are amazing technologies connecting us with each other as never before, with immense quantities of knowledge, and with capacities to do and create things far beyond what previous generations had imagined. We live in terrible times as well. The structure and dynamics of the global economy generate deepening inequalities, instabilities, and destructiveness that throw into question the future of human civilization and even humanity's ability to survive. An eroding quality of life for more and more of the world's laboring majorities is matched by growing authoritarianism, irrationality, and violence. A voracious market economy designed to enrich already immensely wealthy elites is intimately connected with environmental destruction engulfing our world. On this last point, it seems there is good news and bad news. The good news, uh, a scientific consensus projects that climate change currently being driven by the immensely powerful fossil fuel industries might still be halted, preventing our being overwhelmed by cascading catastrophes, provided that dramatic and decisive action is soon taken on a global scale. The bad news, the necessary changes will be too costly in the short run for the businesses and governments that make the decisions. So far, the necessary changes are not being implemented. More bad news. The scientific realities will not fade away despite strident denials, eloquent rhetoric, empty promises, or pragmatic compromises. Nature doesn't compromise. Nor are the relatively limited protests, some of which I've been part of, likely to prove adequate to save the situation. We must prepare for catastrophe. Even aside from climate change, a majority of laborers and consumers whose lives enrich the elites face increasing and sometimes horrific difficulties. Some, perhaps things are not quite that bad, or perhaps, as I suspect is the case, they are even worse. Either way, many already seem to feel the old ways of doing things no longer work, and this feeling will probably intensify and increase. With growing urgency, the question is being posed, what is to be done? Sometimes our protests against social and environmental injustice and destruction assume mass proportions. <clears throat> Yet I'm reminded of the impatience half a century back of the sophisticated and highly political literary critic, Philip Roth, when he wrote shortly before his death about the mass movement of young activists arising in the late 1960s. Here's what he said. Historically, we are living on volcanic ground. And one's disappointment with the experience of the new left comes down precisely to this, that it has failed to crystallize from within itself a guiding organization. One need not be afraid of naming it a centralized and disciplined party, for so far, no one has ever invented a substitute for such a party, capable of engaging in daily and even pedestrian practical activity while keeping itself sufficiently alert on the ideological plane so as not to miss its historical opportunity when and if it arises. Rav was drawing on his own residual Leninism of the 1930s, yet even now his comment seems to resonate. Many historians go out of their way in exposing Lenin's supposedly abhorrent character. 
Yet the free-spirited Rosa Luxemburg, a humanistic and democratic revolutionary who would have wasted no time with the terrible person described by some, had a rather different impression of Lenin. I enjoy talking with him. He's clever and well-educated and has such an ugly mug, the kind I like to look at. Angelica Balabanov, who had worked closely with Lenin, was able to specify. From his youth on, Lenin was convinced that most human suffering and most of human suffering and of moral, legal, and social deficiencies were caused by class distinctions. She explained... He was also convinced that class struggle alone could put an end to exploiters and exploited and create a society of the free and equal. He gave himself entirely to this end, and he used every means in his power to achieve it. From a location on the right end of the political spectrum, Winston Churchill sought a measured balance of, or a balanced measure of his mortal enemy. He hated what Lenin represented and even hailed Mussolini's fascist dictatorship in Italy for its triumphant struggle against the bestial appetites and passions of Leninism. Yet he wrote of Lenin, his mind was a remarkable instrument. When its, li when its light shone, it revealed the whole world, its history, its sorrows, its stupidities, its shams, and above all, its wrongs. It was capable of universal comprehension in a degree rarely reached among men. It is worth adding an insight from sometime sympathizer Max Eastman, who suggested that one of Lenin's contributions in the theory and practice of Marxism was a rejection of people who talk revolution and like to think about it, but do not mean business the people who talked revolution but did not intend to produce it. Animated by such convictions, Lenin helped build a powerful revolutionary movement in his native Russia, culminating in the Russian Revolution of 1917, which he and his comrades believed was the beginning of a global wave of socialist revolutions. He was a key architect of modern communism that was designed to help bring about such an outcome. Harlem Renaissance poet Langston Hughes observed, Lenin walks around the world, black, brown, and white receive him. Language is no barrier. The strangest tongues believe him. This testimony comes from the 20th century, an age of hopeful revolution, horrific civil war, often triumphant counter-revolution, and ongoing class struggles. But does Lenin's project offer anything useful for us in our own time? This book, in its subtext, suggesting an affirmative answer to that question, dispenses with six historiographical myths. One, Lenin favored dictatorship over democracy. Two, his so-called Marxism was a cover for his own totalitarian views. Three, he favored a super-centralized, political party of a new type, with power concentrated at the top, himself as party dictator. Four, he favored rigid political controls over culture, art, and literature. Five, he believed that through such authoritarian methods, a socialist utopia could be imposed on backward Russia. And six, flowing naturally from all of this, he became one of history's foremost mass murderers. This book rejects all such false negatives, at the same time seeking to identify actual negatives, which inevitably can be found in Lenin and the tradition to which he was central. Faced with the complex swirl of Lenin's life and times and ideas, one can focus on matters and select ideas, adding up to a Leninism from which decent people must turn away. This book's approach is different. In her critique of the Russian Revolution, Rosa Luxemburg emphasized her determination to distinguish the essential in Lenin from the non-essential. Her critique of the non-essential was designed to help advance the triumph 
of what she saw as essential in Lenin's revolutionary Bolshevism. In this brief study, the focus is on what seems to me to be those essential qualities. Without the accumulation of experience, cadres, relationships, and authority within the working class, a would-be revolutionary organization cannot actually become a revolutionary organization. This can only be achieved through practical activism. For some would-be revolutionary organizations, its members seem to feel it is sufficient to develop and express revolutionary thoughts, revolutionary positions. These can be developed through discussions and study groups. But defining and expressing politically correct positions becomes primary for some would-be revolutionary groups. This may take the form of arguing against the, ca the capitalist ruling class or against non-revolutionary groups or against other would-be revolutionary groups. It is certainly the case that Lenin was fully prepared to engage in polemics and arguments, but what was primary for him was helping to mobilize practical struggles capable of materially defending and advancing the urgent needs of workers and the oppressed, struggles that can make sense to people in the here and now, but also tilt toward mass revolutionary consciousness. And if fought effectively, insurgency, and power shift, ultimately revolution. For Lenin, theory, education, and the articulation of principled positions was inseparable from such practical work. The Bolsheviks engaged in practical campaigns that helped define them, that created a practical framework of struggle in which they might form united fronts and in some cases converge with other groups, prepared to fight the good fight and push toward victory. Only in that way could an organization of would-be revolutionaries become a revolutionary organization. This approach was simply expressed in the explanation of V. R. Dunn, leader of the militant and victorious Minneapolis Teamsters strikes of 1934. He said, our policy was to organize and build strong unions so workers could have something to say about their own lives and assist in changing the present order into a socialist society. One key prin revolutionary principle involves the political independence of the working class, the refusal to subordinate the struggles of the working class to the leadership of pro-capitalist parties. No democracy in the world puts aside the class struggle and the ubiquitous power of money, Lenin noted, adding that while in a country such as the United States, capitalists and workers had equal political rights, in fact, they are not equal in class status. One class, capitalists, own the means of production and live on the unearned product of the labor of the workers. The other, the class of wage workers own no means of production and live by selling their labor power in the market. He warned that the so-called bipartisan system of the pro-capitalist parties, Democrats and Republicans, has been one of the most powerful means of preventing the rise of an independent working class that is genuinely socialist party. Another principle involves opposition to all forms of racism, ethnic bigotry, or oppression based on gender or sexuality. A third involves opposition to imperialism and war. A fourth, becoming increasingly urgent in our time, is uncompromising opposition to the destruction of a livable environment. A fifth principle is a commitment to genuine democracy, rule by the people, as essential both to our future world and within the movement to create that better future. A sixth principle involves an internationalist orientation, solidarity across borders, a commitment to global collaboration among the workers and oppressed of all countries. Uh, I wanna add something here. I gave you a list 
and it's not that the most important and the least important are listed. They're all, they're inseparable. It's an inseparable package. The process of testing different perspectives and learning from actual struggles, accompanied by debates and splits, but also united efforts and fusions, will be necessary on the way to creating a revolutionary party worthy of its name. Lenin insisted we must at all costs set out first to learn, secondly to learn, and thirdly to learn, and then to see to it that learning shall really become part of our very being, that it shall actually and fully become a constituent element of our social life. But he also insisted that we must learn through doing, learning through actual struggles against oppression and exploitation, collectively evaluating that experience, and then thinking through what to do next. That's it. Thank you, Paul. And now we will move on and hear from Jody Dean, socialist activist, political theorist, professor, author, and editor. Go ahead, Jody. Okay, great. Um, I'm so um, happy to be um, part of this discussion of um, Paul's new book. Um, it's a real gift to the next generation of activists and to the generation of people who are facing climate change and deepening inequality. Um, it's like Paul gives the gift of Lenin to um, young organizers and activists as a resource from them, for them to learn from and draw on today. So the Lenin that um, Paul gives us, he, he's not like a historical activist, you know, a historical artifact, like someone in the past. Right? This is a present thinker who is supposed to help us and enliven our thinking about our circumstances today. Um, the Lenin Paul gives us, is this is not dogmatic, it's not doctrinal, right? It's a resource. It's someone who can teach us, someone we can learn from. So um, I really imagine this book as a text of political education, right? Not, it's like, so it's not like some sort of simple recitation of, you know, here's what Lenin says, blah, blah, blah. And it's not just a direct application. Like here we can mechanically, they did this for, you know, around Brest Litovsk, so we do this. Like, it's not like this at all, right? It's much more um, a guide to thinking about the task of the present, which is actually um, how uh, um, Lenin's wife, Krupskaya, said how Lenin read Marx was as a guide. And I think that's the way that Paul reads Lenin and the way that Paul gives Lenin to us as a guide, because the, um, the challenge we're facing actually need Lenin. Lenin can help us today. So, you know, with, with that, I also want to say that for people who are like super hardcore into Lenin, um, we might have wished for other things in the book, right? We might have wished for more, um, maybe related to Lenin's discussion of the development of capitalism in Russia and how this led to a super nuanced understanding of class structure, the differentiated class structure in the peasantry, or, you know, the kind of super Lenin heads might want to wanted more details about Lenin the organizer, right? Whether, you know, the details about um, how Lenin is organizing the party, um, how he's using the party to prepare for um, revolution, or how, is he, how he's working to organize the government or the economy or socialist society. So we can imagine, you know, the, the super hardcore people might want other things, but that's not the book that this is, right? This is a book to guide discussion to guide, introduce new people into thinking about Lenin and to, you know, let us, um, yeah, let us learn from him. So again, if you're really hardcore, you might be saying like, but wait a minute, how exactly does Lenin do it? Right? What is exactly guiding Lenin's choices? What are his priorities? How do they change? How does he know when to compromise? How does Lenin know what kind of flexibility a situation calls for? When does he retreat and when does he, does he advance? Um, in my view, Paul subordinates some of these questions to a more general presentation of Lenin, the radical Democrat. And so that's kind of, that's where I wanna focus um, my remarks today. 
This presentation of um, Lenin, the radical Democrat, is a crucial component of Paul's general debunking of common, lith- common myths about Lenin, right? His, his general effort to prove to a new generation that like, no matter what they've heard, Lenin was not a power hungry totalitarian dictator, not at all, right? Lenin was committed to the overthrow of Tsarism. He was committed to the establishment for the very first time, a true democracy that was gonna be a democracy for the people, right? For the poor um, and not for the money bags. Um, this, as Paul, um, you know, of course, says, um, is the dictatorship of the proletariat, right? The form of the state that will wither away as people develop the practices and habits necessary for communism, right? The dictatorship of the proletariat or you know, true democracy is a transitional state necessary for suppressing the bourgeoisie. So one of my questions is why here and now given the world we're in and the problems we face, why establishing Lenin as a Democrat, you know, small d, obviously, um, why this is so crucial to Paul? Um, am I am I frozen? Yeah. Am I am I still frozen? Yeah. Okay, but you can still hear me. I'll just keep going. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I hope my face comes alive. That's not a great pose, but okay. <laughs> anyway, so. Um, What the question that I'm posing is, why establishing Lenin as a Democrat is so crucial to Paul? It seems to me that most evocations of democracy today are vague, um, that they often, that the ones that we hear in the movements are often rather moralistic rather than political, that um, too often we rarely distinguish between democracy in the party, democracy in the movements, democracy in society and democracy in government, and the various ways of instituting or practicing democracy in each of these fora. So one of the things that's interesting is to try to, when we speak in these broad terms of democracy, um, exactly which location matters and how might the different locations impact how we think about what democracy is and how to institutionalize or arrange arrange democracy. And I think this is especially important in a social media age, right? Because this is with a Lenin book that Paul's given us is a way to think about the present. So in a social media age and an age where there's this nonstop circulation of trash talk and troll and trolling, being clear that disagreements among those who share a common goal and set of principles is not the same thing as allowing every view to get a hearing and giving every critic a voice. It's also not separate from the suppression of some views and practices. And so on this score, I'd like to ask Paul to tell us some more about um, why he, um, what was important for him for presenting Lenin as a radical Democrat and what lessons he thinks young activist readers should take from that. Next. Paul emphasizes that the party was a collective creation. It wasn't just Lenin's party. At some point, I think Lenin says, um, the party doesn't create the revolution, the revolution creates the party. The party was a site of intense polemics, disagreement and study. And yet even around its split, right? The Bolshevik Menshevik split, even around that it held together. Um, Its basic organizing principle was democratic centralism, freedom of discussion and unity of action. And Paul, one of the things the discussion in your book made me think about was how even as today's social media environment is one of um, constant argument and disagreement within left spaces, there seems to be very little room for or tolerance of polemics. It's like we lack the space to engage in in principle disagreement. So if we disagree, like we tend to be on different sides. And I and I was starting to try to figure out like why is this the case? Like what is the difference that makes a difference between Lenin's time, Lenin's party, and our own situation? Is it that the contemporary left is afraid to win? Is it that we'd rather embrace 
the weakest then build strength? Or is it something like we're too individualistic or stuck on our own take? So disagreement is just like, it's too fragile. If you disagree with me, you know, my take has been harmed or something. And and if so, does this doom us to ineffective mo- movementism? And I'm, I'm bringing up these questions not just because they're so pressing on the contemporary left. And I, think, I feel like I've listened to like five podcasts in the last month that have been talking about this. But I think that these questions are also really important um, because they're questions around the cadre party as a form. And even if it wasn't Lenin's individual creation, he was one of the architects of this form, one of those who helped wield it and use it for seizing the state. Now, my own view um, is that we desperately need a powerful cadre party today and that we can't think enough about how to build it, how to make it work, and so on. So I'd like to hear more about how you're thinking about um, the, the challenges around building a cadre party today. Um, Also, Paul, sometimes in your enthusiasm for portraying Lenin as a radical Democrat, I kind of had the impression that you thought that an open democratic mass party should be the model for socialist organization, that it was only the reality of Tsarist Russia that made the um, Russian Social Democratic Labor Party um, have a clandestine um, aspect to it or clandestine period, clandestine formation, that it was only because of czarism that it took that form and then that it was only because of the reality of civil war and the resulting ban on factions and war communism and the establishment of um, the the, the kind of abolition of other parties um, and the terror and all that, that all of the, that um, those external factors, those factors related to civil war, if if only it weren't for that, then we would have the mass social democratic party that we need to have. And so I was wondering about if that's actually what you think, that these problems are just these sort of exogenous problems or or not. You know, you tell us that Lenin believed in the goodness of the revolution. And there are times, particularly towards the end, I started wondering whether or not you shared the view of Lenin or shared Lenin's faith in the Bolshevik revolution and whether or not it was ultimately good. Anyway, I, as I'm suggesting, I, I sometimes feel like the impression that you give in the book is of a democratic ideal wrecked by, wrecked by harsh reality. And, um, and I'm not so sure about that vision of Lenin, um, the Communist Party, or revolution. Because if we recognize that we're not going to democratically get to socialism, that the capitalist class will fight to the bitter, bitter, will fight to the bitter end. Then we have to be prepared for that struggle, and that involves discipline, right? Lenin would call it iron discipline. Winning doesn't happen overnight. Um, it's not like that. What um, ineffective Johnson and Johnson COVID vaccine, like one and done. No, um, it takes a long time. And Ingalls said somewhere that revolution is the most authoritarian thing there is. So the party capable of flexibility, the party capable of responding to changing circumstances requires extraordinary coherence and consistency. Again, iron discipline. And I I sometimes had the the feeling that in your effort to make Lenin a, a Democrat, that you underplayed this basic dimension of revolutionary politics and kind of too quickly jumped to the old problem of, you know, substitutionism and how a, ma- a, van- a minority shouldn't substitute itself for the majority. I mean, of course, you know, fully agreed the party has to win over people. There's no shortcut around organizing um, at all, right? I mean, in these days, you know, there's no, sh- no, sh- no shortcut to actually building the cadre party. Um, there's no shortcut to preparing ourselves and preparing preparing people for what's going to come, right? The planet is warming, and yet the energy companies keep on drilling. Inequality is intensifying. Life expectancy is declining. The right is arming itself. People are freaking openly defending fascism, and the left hasn't yet cohered into a form adequate 
for dealing with the situation. And so um, I want to I'm trying to push you here some to talk more about the form that the party should take, given the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Yeah. One last point. Paul takes from Lenin and gives to us a view that emphasizes practical activism, principled politics, and revolutionary patience. And I think this is just, you know, 100% correct. It's what building the, pop, the party absolutely requires. And Paul emphasizes that for Lenin, class struggle was a struggle against all forms of oppression national oppression, sexual oppression, oppression of peasants, um, ethnic oppression, and so on. And in this context, our present reality, where so many people repeat the tired and false view of, co of communism as a class first politics that ignores race, sex and imperialism, this point that Paul makes about being on the side of the oppressed everywhere and being against all bigotry and oppression that is crucial to Leninism is just indispensable and it can't be said um, often enough. And I think if, if if everyone who reads this book learns that one lesson, then in fact, we'll be um, a few steps further toward building the party that we need. Thank you very much, Jody. And now we're going to hear from union organizer, activist, socialist, feminist, Linda Lowe. Linda, please go ahead. Thank you, Julia, and everyone. And congratulations, Paul. This book does pose powerful questions. Can we respond to catastrophes in our own time and help to forge revolution? Can we learn from the past? One comes away believing that we can and we must. I will share some key takeaways for me based on my own experience, emphasizing methods, not formulas, and observations to help guide our discussion of what to do next. The crises we face today are deepened by the crisis of leadership. Lenin and his comrades were continually evaluating their own leadership, including forging new leaders out of struggles and recognized that as central to their historic project. The international nature of capitalism is key. In Lenin's time, the development of imperialism had a catastrophic impact on workers in colonial contexts as well as in advanced countries. Lenin warned not only of intercapitalist rivalry between nations, but also within nations among workers. Profound new obstacles brought by World War I, millions dead on battlefields and from disease and starvation, made it impossible to sustain the material achievements and democratic rule, enjoyed for a short but glorious time, but within the confines of one nation desperately needing help. Rosa Luxemburg was among those who understood that only transformation on a world scale could enable successful revolutions in any one country. The book quotes Luxembourg extensively, including, quote, the fate of the revolution in Russia depended fully on international events, end quote. Further on, the harsh realities inside Soviet Russia, quote, it is clear under such conditions, being caught in the pincers of the imperialist powers from all sides, neither socialism nor the dictatorship of the proletariat can become a reality, but at most a character of both, end quote. Despite the failure to fully realize the dreams of the revolution, we remain inspired by the revolution itself and its leaders. Today in the United States and other advanced countries, the abundant means exist to feed the world over and provide a quality standard of living without ravage, ravaging the world's resources. But without wealth, but with wealth and power concentrated in the hands of fewer and greedy billionaires, the absence of a revolutionary leadership on a world scale is daunting, along with the question of whether it could be forged in time. Another major lesson is the role of democratic demands. Lenin from the re revolutionary proletariat and the right of nations to self-determination, quote, we must combine the revolutionary struggle against capitalism with a revolutionary program and tactics in respect to all democratic demands, including a republic, a militia, election of 
government officials by the people, equal rights for women, self-determination of nations, he goes on. And quote, some of these transformations will be started before the overthrow of the bourgeoisie, others in the course of this overthrow, and still others after it, end quote. Whether calling for peace, bread, and land then, or women's LGBTQ voting or labor rights now, these demands and many others may be granted or partially so as concessions that can be won or taken away depending on the relationship of forces, but only fully realizable after the overthrow of capitalism. They remain a powerful part of our organizing arsenal. Defeats and setbacks are also invaluable experiences upon which future struggles are built. Despite the failure to take power in 1905, it is described as a powerful dress rehearsal for future upheavals. From Lenin, quote, wait, we will have another 1905. To the workers that year of struggle provided an example of what is to be done, end quote. He spoke later of learning to convert earlier struggles into, quote, something broader, more concentrated, and more class conscious, end quote. Similar lessons can be drawn from uprisings in our lifetimes. France in 1968 and students in Mexico that same year. Also, the anti-Vietnam War movement against invo U.S. involvement in Vietnam, a powerful upheaval eventually involving mass courageous remarks from Martin Luther King Jr. in his powerful Riverside Church speech linked the civil rights movement to U.S. foreign policy, calling the U.S. government the greatest, quote, purveyor of violence in the world, end quote. We speak today of intersectionality. This concept essentially prevailed in Lenin's time, too, and was central to the making of revolution. The book quotes historian Rex Wade, who describes 1917 as, quote, a series of concurrent and overlapping revolutions, end quote. We also gain a sense of breadth, diversity, and youth of the party in years leading to the revolution. Among them, metal workers, lithographers, shoemakers, pharmacy workers, students, writers, artists, and more. I believe a comparable cross-section of our times will be necessary to, for to forge the leadership of future revolutionary struggle. Also vital in Lenin's time and ours, an appreciation of the various stages of organizing and mobilizing with an eye to building leadership, knowing when to be bold, what to demand, and how to involve in the decision-making process the most forces who have a stake in the outcome. This is true in today's movement for abortion rights and reproductive justice. The largest outpourings are products of coalition building, not really united funds that pose power, but nonetheless major opportunities for participants to gain a sense of our own collective power. January 2017 saw the largest ever women's rights demonstrations worldwide. The interconnections between racism, sexism, and the working class were evident in banners opposing a Muslim ban and four black women's lives and four working women of the world uniting and more carried by millions in Washington, Chicago, West Coast from Alaska to Alabama. Similar was true in the aftermath of George Floyd's assassination when millions took to streets and towns, many that never saw protests before. But most of these outpourings have not been sustained. A conscious and well-organized leadership has been missing to sustain these movements and connect them to one another toward a genuine challenge to the entire system. Understanding partial victories or even defeat is also important. For example, the outcome of strikes which include calculations by leaders and a measure of the militancy of rank and file to stay out one day longer to be one day stronger. It is unfolding on UAW picket lines now and was exhibited for months by writers and actors where a growing anger that capitalist greed has fired up a sense among workers that they should benefit from the wealth created off their backs. The Madison, Wisconsin uprising of 2011 brought forces into motion on a scale not seen in decades. 100,000 rank and file workers poured into the streets repeatedly from across the public sector while mostly students occupied the state capitol for three weeks. 
a mini exercise in self-government inside and a massive lesson in solidarity outside. It was sparked by an outrageous bill, Act 10, which would strip collective bargaining power from state workers and also bring massive funding cuts to Wisconsin's Badger Care Healthcare. It eventually escalated beyond anything the official union sanctioned or envisioned. I'll never forget the drum rolls and embraces inside the rotunda as our Chicago root contingent led by the Chicago Teachers Union alongside iron and steel workers from Chicago's historic southeast side entered the Capitol. Eventually tractors driven by farmers also joined the marches around the Capitol. Posters calling for general strikes seemed more realistic then than at any time I'd ever experienced. But it was soon clear that massive labor solidarity was lacking and that the Democratic Party and labor bureaucracy would not take the necessary steps. Picket signs were traded in for petition boards to recall the odious neoliberal governor, a recall that failed but succeeded in pulling the plug on the power of independent labor mobilizing. The outcome was defeat. The hated governor remained and the union busting Act 10 was passed. But the consciousness raised in the course of that struggle cannot be taken away. Some demoralization, yes, but also indelible education and connections made. The cutting short of this struggle was a powerful example of a deep crisis of leadership. Activists across many movements increasingly named capitalism as responsible for today's catastrophes, but not as many name socialism as the ultimate solution, and those that do, do not all agree on the path forward. But catastrophes keep unfolding across every continent, wiping out swaths of populations in devastating floods, fires, wars, and famine, staggering loss and pandemic, bold and sweeping attacks on control over our bodies, brutal racist attacks whipped up by an emboldened right and unchecked by the other spineless party of capitalism, not to mention voting rights, banned books, and deep assaults on education. For the most personal of homeless dying in 125 degree heat to thousand drowning, all are catastrophic and all are inextricably related and therefore so must the response be. We have a long way to go, especially to assert independent political action. There are a few sterling examples of independent labor and other actions by exploited and oppressed. The current UAW strike and other pockets of resistance by water defenders, Stop Cop City and more. 2012, the Chicago, Teamsters, Chicago Teachers Union brought tens of thousands of members and supporters into the streets building solidarity between unions and with the community. It is important to note that there were conscious socialists among the CT, fairly new CTU leadership. And I'll also point out not all from the same organization nor with the same views of transforming societies, but they understood they had to unite to fight the Board of Education and the captains of finance. They put into practice several lessons of the historic 1934 Minneapolis Teamster Strike that Paul earlier mentioned, organizing fighting, flying picket squads, putting out daily strike bulletins, and building membership skills and democratic participation from the rank and file. Without becoming avowed socialists, not most of them, strikers nevertheless learned lessons in class struggle and union democracy because of the conscious leaders that led them. A strike wave of teachers, including across the South, was inspired by the CTU. Toward the end of his life, Lenin realized that a full global revolution would not happen in his lifetime. He never stopped sharing his vision for it. As quoted from what is to be done in the summing up section of this book, quote, we should dream. The rift between dreams and reality causes no harm if only the person dreaming believes seriously in the dream, if there is connection between dreams and life. Look, end quote, looking ahead to a possibly grim future with ever more ferocious and devastating catastrophes likely. The need for leadership is huge. Will it be forged in time and how? These are open questions. 
The book emphasizes that there is no inevitable outcome, but there are glimmers of hope in the resistance today. As in Lenin's time, tomorrow's leaders must emerge from today's struggles with a premium on young activists, major involvement from communities of color and across broad spectrums of the working class and all exploited and oppressed, including the unorganized community groups, schools, churches, and more. Hopefully they will draw important lessons from the past, seeking a healthy balance between theory, program, and action, using flexibility and caution to always have their program shaped by actual experiences in the struggles of today. The American working class has many times been described as a sleeping giant. While some have been awakening from slumber, far more have yet to wake up to the awareness of their own collective power. What conscious people like us can do to move things in that direction is a key component, in my opinion, of what to do next. I hope this challenge will help shape our discussion today. Thank you, Thank so, you so much, Linda. I'm just gonna, gonna... Okay, thanks. Um, I really appreciate bringing in the modern day examples that we were able to hear of different struggles. Thank you. Um, now we're going to move on to hear from Cliff Connolly, member of Democratic Socialists of America, the Marxist unity group within DSA, and contributor to the Marxist magazine Cosmonaut. Cliff, go ahead. Cool. Uh, I appreciate you all having me here today. As the least known bald man of the three that we've talked about, uh, it's a real honor. So <laughs> I'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> uh, Lenin scholar Lars Lee once wrote that Marxism is not only scientific in content, but crucially narrative in form. His exact words, referring to excerpts from Engels' socialism, utopian and scientific, were, quote, Scientific socialism tells the proletariat a story about itself, its past, historical conditions, its present, oppression, and its future, world-freeing deed. Since this story will itself inspire the proletariat to carry out the great deed, telling the story is a precondition for freeing the world." End quote. Lenin was perhaps the best storyteller of the 20th century socialist movement. While his writing on organization and internal party matters often receive more attention, he was adept at crafting a narrative of liberation for the Russian working classes of his time. He wrote about their past struggles against serfdom and the heroic but doomed movement of the populist Narodniks. He wrote scathing political indictments of their present circumstances, which oriented workers and peasants alike against the monarchy, even during the course of what could have been purely economic shop floor disputes. One of his best known works, State and Revolution, painted a beautiful picture of the ideal future for a socialist state in Russia, which sadly faded in the wake of the wider European revolution's failure. Lenin understood how to address the laboring classes past, present, and future in such a way that they were inspired en masse to undertake the greatest experiment in majority rule and economic planning in world history. The central theme of Lenin's story was the proletariat's call of duty to raise the red banner of socialism and lead the charge as the vanguard in the battle for democracy. We need a story that will speak to the 21st century American proletariat and set our movement on fire. Just like the narrative crafted by Lenin and his Bolshevik comrades, it must contextualize our history and showcase our roots in the struggles of the past, explain the challenges and opportunities we face in the present, and inspire with a grounded vision of the future where our class accomplishes its historic mission. While the focus of this panel is Lenin's relevance to the class struggle of our era, I'm sure we all understand that he was not a lone genius hatching brilliant plans and giving marching orders. The liberatory narrative of the Bolsheviks was crafted collectively, with sharp debates forging a final product that was greater than the sum of its intellectual parts. Our process will be no different, or it will produce nothing of value. Thus, the narrative that I'm sketching out today is not intended for the printing press. It is one of what will hopefully be numerous drafts, and I invite everyone listening to put their criticisms on paper for all to read. 
economic data, campaign platforms, strike waves, theoretical texts, and party meetings all appeal immensely to a small minority of dedicated movement activists. But as Lennon once remarked, serious politics begin in the millions. If we want to reach the millions, we need a damn good story. I spoke at length during our talk in Chicago last month about the immediate forebears of American socialism, the revolutionary abolitionists. John Brown, Harriet Tubman, William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, Wendell Phillips, and all the rest not only directly influenced the Marxist emigres from Europe who fought alongside them against slavery, they went on to inspire the homegrown revolutionaries who led the workers' struggles of the 20th century. But our movement's history did not begin with them. Abolitionism was born in the pews, itself a product of the dissident English Protestants who rebelled against the British Empire's state church and brought their revolutionary energies with them when they colonized North America. Tragically, they did not recognize the contradictions between their struggle for natural rights and the project of dispossessing the indigenous peoples whose land they fled to. Nonetheless, abolitionist thought and by extension, American socialist thought are both rooted in the English Christian dissident tradition that began shortly after the Black Death in the 14th century and finally exploded with the English Civil War of the mid 17th century. Now, as Marxists, we understand that popular movements are the result of underlying economic bases that they spring from and the post hoc ideological, in this case, religious justifications come afterwards. In other words, factors out of human control create certain economic interests, and humans respond by crafting stories to explain to one another why they must cooperate to pursue those interests. This is true today in the proletariat struggle for democratic governance and socialist planning, and it was true seven centuries ago for English dissidents. Their struggle was far narrower in scope, but just as bloody and protracted. In the wake of the mass death caused by the bubonic plague pandemic, English landowners faced a labor shortage, something that might sound familiar, and the prospect of having to pay increased wages for their agricultural labors. Uh, they found a way around this problem by evicting tenant farmers from their land and building walls around what had been commonly owned land, sometimes illegally and sometimes with the backing of the law, thereby depriving the laboring population of their means of subsistence and forcing them to work for lower wages. This process, known as enclosure, was the key driver of social unrest in England for hundreds of years and resulted in the slow proletarianization of the peasantry and the birth of capitalism in the British Isles. Those who rebelled against enclosure created narratives to inspire and agitate those around them. They spoke of landowners making deals with the devil and angels sent by God urging them to fight for their ancient right to the common ownership of land. One rebel leader, John Reynolds, claimed to be endowed with authority by the king and God himself to tear down the enclosures and protect his comrades with the contents of his sacred pouch. By the time he was caught and executed, he was known to the world as Captain Pouch. The contents of the container in question turned out to be a piece of moldy cheese. The humor in these events belie a deeper truth, a story that captures an audience experiencing a crisis and provides a solution can tear down walls and plant the seeds of revolution. Even if the storyteller is up against the most powerful people around and his only material resource is a hunk of green cheese. Just as socialists today are derided by our detractors as pinkos and reds, those who fought for communal land in the medieval era were labeled levelers and diggers. These terms stuck in the English political vernacular and were later deployed in the 1640s against two particular factions of the Republican movement, which sought to abolish the monarchy and establish a government led by parliament. The levelers were radical Democrats who sought to expand male suffrage, establish religious freedom from the state church, abolish debtors' prisons, and generally reform the parliamentary republic that they fought for alongside more conservative forces in the military conflict against the king. The diggers operated at the same time but rejected the authority of both parliament and king in favor of loosely affiliated agricultural communes, which they built by destroying enclosures. 
Both groups claimed divine authority, with the levelers emphasizing natural rights endowed upon man by God, and the diggers centering the language of Acts 432 from the Bible, quote, the group of believers was one in heart and mind. No one said that any of his belongings was his own, but they all shared with one another everything they had, end quote. The levelers, just like the abolitionists and socialists who came after them, crafted their revolutionary narrative in a process of comradely debate and then spread that narrative through agitational pamphlets and mass meetings. One of these debates has been repeated throughout history by every revolutionary movement in English-speaking countries. Should we be loyal or disloyal to the formal charter of government that we live under? In other words, are we, are we fighting to preserve a just system or to smash an unjust system and build something new in its place? For the Englishmen, that charter was the Magna Carta in their debates raged over whether to claim its authority or stand in opposition to its injustices. Military defeat in their civil war made the question moot as the monarchy was restored and their forces scattered. The abolitionists who had read the levelers' tracts and incorporated their language of natural rights and expanded suffrage into the political and religious rhetoric that fanned the flames of their crusade against slavery, they, they faced the opposite problem. They won their civil war, resulting in a half-victory that abolished formal chattel slavery but left open the question of democratic rights for black Americans, in addition to the loophole under which forced prison labor continues to plague black communities with mass incarceration to this day. Their debates between loyalty to the U.S. Constitution and all its anti-democratic clauses and a revolutionary struggle for a democratic republic with black leadership. <clears throat> Sorry, <laughs> lost my place. Uh, black leadership and a new charter of government, which they adopted at the Chatham Convention in 1858, that debate ended in victory for the Loyalist camp. This was partly the result of revolutionary cadres being killed in John Brown's failed attempt at insurrection in Virginia, which severely demoralized their supporters, but ultimately it came down to manpower and materiel. By 1860, the federal government was prepared to defeat the terrible slave power on the battlefield, and the abolitionists did not feel up to that task on their own. Seizing the opportunity, they joined the fray en masse and successfully pressured the government with the help of a mass strike by enslaved black workers in the Confederacy into changing its war goals from preservation of the Union to the abolition of chattel slavery. But the abolitionist movement was never confined to this goal. They pursued the total emancipation of black peoples in North America, the establishment of true democracy on the continent, and a foreign policy which supported revolutionaries in Ireland, Haiti, India, China, and beyond. They pursued these aims during Reconstruction by entering government as U.S. Marshals, bureaucrats in labor departments, and paid organizers in the Freedmen's Bureau. For all their diligent work and bloody sacrifice, what was their reward? The federal government abandoned Reconstruction, withdrew their troops from the South, deployed those troops against striking workers in the North, and sat on their hands as former Confederate officers waged a terror campaign against black and abolitionist communities, ultimately resulting in the lynch mob regime of Jim Crow. I speak to you today from Atlanta, where we are attempting to stop the construction of an urban warfare training center for our police department, which was founded from the remnants of former slave patrols on a road named after a slave owner, which once housed a prison plantation where civil rights leaders, including Kwame Ture, were subjected to forced agricultural labor. Slavery and Jim Crow are alive, and they are killing my neighbors every day. This is why I call the Civil War a half victory. The abolitionists accomplished their most immediate goal, but they were ultimately defeated because they put themselves in a position of reliance on the federal government, not just to recognize their political aspirations, but to safeguard them from violent reaction. This ended in predictable disaster, as constitutional loyalism always does. Mass liberatory movements motivated by existential crises are nothing new. Whether people face enclosure, slavery, imperialism, fascism, capitalist exploitation, or ecological collapse, 
they will eventually respond with revolutionary fervor motivated by stories that imbue their struggles with higher purpose. Each of these crises I mentioned continue to plague humanity in some form in some part of the globe or everywhere all at once. I have highlighted past attempts at revolutionary response to crisis in our movement's forebears in order to center what I believe is the most pressing question up for debate today. Are we going to respond to the potential extinction of our species within the limited bounds of a 300-year-old constitution written by dead slavers, or will we dare to win? Our future is not guaranteed. We will either replace the world's imperialist oligarchies with socialist republics grounded in democracy and ecology, or we will have nothing at all. In Marx's time, workers had nothing to lose but their chains. Today, we have a world to win and a world to lose. I will conclude with excerpts from Lenin's letter to the American workers. Quote, he is no socialist who does not understand that one cannot and must not hesitate to make even such a sacrifice as territory, heavy defeat, indemnities to capitalists, and the interest of beginning the international proletarian revolution. The American people has a revolutionary tradition adopted by the best representatives of the American proletariat, the greatest world historic, progressive, and revolutionary significance of the American Civil War, the overthrow of the rule of slave owners. The American workers will not follow the bourgeoisie. They will be with us for civil war against the bourgeoisie. The whole history of the world and the American labor movement strengthens my conviction." End quote. Comrades, let us not be cowed into confining ourselves to working within the limits of a constitution that was designed to prevent majority rule and economic planning, the building blocks of socialism. Let us make good on Lenin's confidence in us and declare war on the bourgeoisie and their oligarchic state. Let us imagine living in a genuine democracy with an equitable economy and an actual plan to build a livable future. If we don't, there may not be another generation to correct our mistakes. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cliff, for finishing off our presentations today. Uh, we have a world to lose is definitely going to keep me up at night from now on. So thanks for sharing that. <laughs> um, I want to say that we have a lot of really rich material here that we've shared and what we've heard for us all to consider in discussion. Um, but I'm also really excited for questions to come from the live stream. So if you are watching, please put your questions into the stream so that we can bring those into our conversation here. Um, I feel a little bit like everyone has done such an expert job at bringing out the very important challenges that the left faces that uh, the first question that comes to my mind is, can you solve these problems, please? Um, but I won't actually pose that to anyone here today. So I think to start off our discussion, I'd like to um, go back to some of the points that Jody was bringing up and questions that were posed to Paul specifically. Um, I'm curious about this portrayal of Lenin as a radical Democrat and what your thought process is behind that, Paul, and if you have um, you know, more you can expound on for us about why you chose the portrayal that you did in your book. And you're muted. Okay, well, yes, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I was excited about uh, the cluster of questions that uh, Jody raised. Uh, and I, I valued uh, the other uh, presentations as well, but uh, let me start with some of what Jody was raising. Uh, why did I choose to emphasize Lenin as a radical Democrat? Uh, and one aspect of it is, well, he was a socialist. And that's key to all that we're talking about. Uh, because as I see it, uh, and uh, uh, Linda referred to it, and Cliff referred to it, uh, and uh, I, I'm confident that Jody would agree, uh, socialism means uh, uh, democratic control by the laboring majorities of our economy. 
so that uh, Lenin was in favor of that, not in favor of the economy run for the benefit of the peoples by a small elite. Um, but also, uh, as uh, uh, Linda, for example, is emphasizing, uh, the democratic struggle was key in Lenin's thinking, and as Korpskaya also emphasized, especially in the years uh, of World War I, this was central to Lenin's thinking of the whole strategy of, of socialist revolution. Uh, so I think it makes sense to emphasize that and stress that because it's an essential part of uh, what Lenin is about. Um, at the same time, uh, there are additional questions that Jody raised that uh, uh, I, I think need to be uh, explored. Um, one thing is uh, mass, uh, open uh, democratic mass party initially was Lenin's model. He pointed to the German social democrat in what is to be done. He pointed to the German social democratic party as what the, he was aspiring and he and other revolutionaries were aspiring to create. Uh, and uh, I think that um, uh, he did not realize what Rosa Luxemburg was quicker to realize because she was on the scene, that there was a bureaucratic development in some ways reminding me of uh, the kind of uh, problem that Linda pointed to in the United States, in the Wisconsin struggle and so forth, of bureaucratic non-revolutionary elements uh, putting the brakes on uh, a democratic struggle and, and socialist struggle and revolutionary struggle. That was something that uh, was strong in that mass democratic party or the that mass party in, in Germany. Uh, but uh, uh, Jody raises an additional question which I think is worth looking at. Well, uh, did the lack of democracy uh, uh, the uh, hyper discipline and centralism and so forth. Did that just come from the necessity to operate in the underground, the czarist underground? And I don't think that's the case. Uh, did it? Um, I, I do think, and both uh, Cliff and Linda referred to this in in their comments. Uh, there was a problem: the, uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, which. Uh, uh, Lenin defended to his dying breath and that I agree with what he wrote on that and his outlook on uh, uh, the Bolshevik revolution. Um, it was, uh, one aspect of it was it was profoundly democratic and another aspect was that it was uh, um, dependent on uh, uh, or it was rooted in the belief that revolutions would be erupting in Germany and France and other parts of Europe as well as in Asia and so on. Uh, when this failed to materialize, uh, they were stuck, the Bolsheviks were stuck, and it was in the midst of a terrible civil war and uh, foreign interventions and blockade and so forth that uh, pushed the Bolsheviks and Lenin away from this super democratic uh, uh, goal that they had. Um, the question, the a question is, well, what about us now? I mean, we've agreed, uh, uh, things are going to hell in a handbasket, right? There's uh, a catastrophe, environmental catastrophe. Authoritarianism is spreading. Fascist type authoritarianism may be triumphant in more parts of the world. Things are going to get very, very messy. Um, and... I think that it's necessary to have the democratic vision very clear in one's mind and also to realize that it's going to be hard. It's going to be very difficult, as it was for Lenin and the Bolsheviks, to adhere to that, to keep that. Uh, and they were relying on uh, the... Uh, they were relying on the uh, triumph of revolutions in other countries to get them out of uh, the jam that they were in. And uh, in, the, uh, in the letter to American workers that Cliff quoted, uh, he says that we are, a besieged, we are a besieged fortress. We are waiting for the armies of a revolution to triumph in other countries. We believe that they will. Um, and that's going to be a key for us also, that internationalism. Uh, I've spoken too long, <laughs> and I have to stop. Uh, 
But what I would love to be able to do is to talk with Jody and others of us to explore this, you know, more fully, because these are key questions that she's raised. Uh, one last point, um, and that is, and perhaps someone else can speak to it, um, the, the idea of a cadre party that is needed. I completely agree with that. And it would be good to unpack that and discuss that and see how does it fit in with uh, the other kinds of things that we're talking about. Uh, we would, I don't think we're going to be able to finish that discussion uh, or other aspects of the discussion tonight, though. Thank you, Paul. Yes, I think there are a lot of places we can go with our discussion now from this point. Um, I think we should consider some of these questions about the need for a cadre party and also um, how we will build that and where where it is built. I think through the contributions that we heard in the presentations, we know that it is through practical activity that it also that we need to see this element uh, develop. And I'm curious what thoughts the other contributors have about where we see that happening today. I know that Linda provided us with a lot of um, examples of struggles that are both victories and defeats, but also have the ability to build consciousness in our class. Um, so I wonder if we can have a bit of a discussion about where that is built and how we can uh, foster that need for the the cadre party into the activists that we see in, in various realms in our life today. Um, if I saw Cliff give a little nod, maybe if you want to start us off with a, some thoughts that you have on that, and then we can move on to Linda. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Uh, so this sort of comes from my experience in the last uh, five years or so. Um, I was part of an organization called Marxist Center, which I'm sure most people have heard of. Uh, I had people around me that were saying, you know, I, I think we need to focus on uniting the existing left before we, you know, go out to the masses, so to speak. And I thought, that's really stupid. I'm not going to do that. Um, and so I joined Marxist Center, which was very focused on this concept of base building and kind of had an attitude of just like the existing socialist left is there's just too much drama. You know, people are just infighting all the time. Like, they're a tiny minority of the population anyway. Just forget about them and let's go build a million tenant unions. Um, and we did that. I built one in my building. Everyone I knew basically uh, built one in their building uh, when I was in Chicago. And um, it failed uh, abysmally <laughs> and the organization fell apart um, because we hadn't taken the time to figure out if we agreed on anything other than let's build tenant unions. Um, and so that was when I kind of turned around to some of my comrades that have been talking about the United, uniting the existing left and had to say, OK, maybe you guys were onto something. Um, let's talk about this a little more. And I've been thoroughly convinced of that. And that's why I'm in the DSA and why I'm in Marxist Unity Group. I, I thoroughly believe in uniting the existing left, not at the expense of mass work. Of course, we're going to do that all the time. Um, but having that be the focus, I think the way to do that is just to foster comradely and principled debate and cooperation, like we've talked about on this panel, both between organizations and between factions in the same organization. Um, and I've been really excited to see, at least in the DSA, that happening more than what I remember in, say, 2017, um, and also seeing uh, cooperation between DSA and other organizations. That's been really nice. Um, I would also say we should support anyone that is trying to democratize an existing organization um, that maybe is more bureaucratic, doesn't allow factions, doesn't allow open debate. I, I'm going to offend some people by saying, you know, I think the CPUSA is that way. We can disagree on that. That's okay. Um, but, you know, instead of saying, hey, if you're in the CPUSA, just get out, come join XYZ organization, it's better. Let's support those people and say, okay, let's work through how we can make all of our organizations better and build unity between our organizations. Um, and crucially, what we should be aiming for as a final goal is programmatic unity, not theoretical unity. So in other words, let's agree on our strategy 
of, of what we need to do in the long term. We don't necessarily have to agree all the time on particular tactics of how we approach a particular campaign. We certainly don't need to agree on what happened at Kronstadt. That could be fun to talk about, but we don't have to figure that out to, uh, <laughs> to have a revolution in the United States. Um, that's not to say there's not value in history, but you know what I mean? You know, we need to think about, as, as Paul has said many times, what is to be done? Um, so that that would be my model. Um, I don't think that there's any one organization or person that has all the answers. Um, so we need to work on working together. Wonderful. Thank you, Cliff. Yes, really important points about the balance there. Um, I'm curious if Linda, you have any thoughts on this topic? I'd love to hear them. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I do. Um, I, I think all of us here um, on this panel, but uh, I expect many in our listening audience as well have either are either now or have in the past been. It doesn't intended like the the source that used that formulation. But but many of us have been in or are still in organizations that um, uh, uh, consider themselves to be socialist that have aspired. Uh, uh, to uh, the forming uh, uh, sometime in the future of a revolutionary party that could do precisely uh, what the Bolsheviks aspired to. And of course, coming from uh, the standpoint of what we face here in the present, um, in this country and around the world. Um, I don't think that, um, and, and one of the, I saw something in there, somebody in the audience asked about uh, uh, microsex. I don't think that any of us, of any of the groups that exist or have existed in recent history, um, um, have the answer alone. I agree with much of what Cliff said. I think that 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 they've mostly been, or certainly today, are small. Um, they have not succeeded in relating to the masses of people out there, but also in a way that enables a collaboration with other forces that are also trying to do the same thing. I think that that is a, a, a long standing problem of the American left. Um, there's, it's not, a program is important, but there's sometimes a, a uh, overwhelming preoccupation with the precise program to the exclusion of being able to actually work out there in the struggles and finding ways to work together. Um, I think that what the meaning of coalition building, I raised it, I didn't uh, uh, elaborate on it um, in the remarks, but I think that um, that is a vital way that pe people's consciousness isn't only raised, but, but that people decide that they want to be part of an organization that does more than just fight the immediate battle. And I think we have to find ways to work together, uh, those of us in organizations, those of us maybe who were and aren't anymore, so that we can forge what I believe will be a new organization eventually that contains many of the members perhaps, or some of the members of existing ones, but also many of the young people, and it wasn't just to sound cool that I put an emphasis on that, but they are the ones, the, the emerging generation are the ones that um, are gonna live the consequences of the catastrophes we're facing and uh, that will grow worse. And they're the ones that are gonna have to figure out a way to uh, 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 build the organization uh, that we need uh, from the types of things that, that work on specific struggles, like the ones that Cliff mentioned in tenants, but so many others, even union organizations. The last thing for now is I think we have uh, the burden still of the long history of class collaboration that the Communist Party in this country um, uh, had that on the one hand developed a lot of followers and on the other 
hand betrayed them, especially um, in trade union struggles and when it came to taking political steps to go beyond just the fights on the job. Because then you had to be able to challenge the major parties in this country, and uh, they have not historically done that. And to the present day, believe that it's still strategic, and I think it's deadly, that um, we somehow support one of the lesser evils. So in order to take all of the struggles that we are mutually combined in and move it to the next level of the kind of power and strength to lead them uh, in the direction of, of, of overthrowing this system and transforming and replacing it with another, we are going to have to be able to make that break. And I think making that break, as we've seen in other countries, involves forces coming together. It could be in the electoral arena, but not exclusively in the electoral arena. And we're going to have to find a way, and I think Jody also discussed this, of having those debates in a comradely way. Um, this panel has helped me to see the possibility of that and the wisdom of that. And we're going to have to find a way to do that um, or we're going to be in deep trouble in this country. Thank you, Linda. I agree. This panel has been an inspiration for the way that different diverse ideas can come together and grow. Um, so now we are pretty much at the set time, but we can go over a bit. So I'm going to have us move into our wrap ups. Um, I know Jody, you wanted to comment on this, so I'm going to have you go ahead and make that part of your wrap up if that's okay. Then we'll go to Cliff, back to Linda, and then finish with Paul. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much. Um, I One of the great things about um, Paul's book on Lenin is that he articulates a set of principles that it seems to me that everybody on the socialist and communist left shares, namely a commitment to some kind of socialism, a commitment to anti-racism, to labor, to environmental and climate struggles, right? To, you know, um, protecting the earth from <laughs> devastation and destruction, a commitment to anti-imperialism and a commitment to um, sort of women's LGBTQ um, feminist struggles. That actually there may be a lot more unity than we're aware of. And that maybe part of it is for us to orient ourselves more to recognizing we may be stronger than we think. Um, you know, the right thinks that we control the world and that's kind of great. Like they're super afraid of us, right? They have like huge anti-communist statues and they're always like even presidents talk about us. And so it might be that part of our orientation has to be to recognize the strength that we have. And that one of the ways that we can do that is actually to not trash each other or parts of us that we don't like um, and recognize the kind of ecosystem uh, that there are folks involved in tenant struggles and they may disagree. And that's that's OK. Some of them will be in a communist or socialist party. Some of the people who are involved in in um, the struggles around um, reproductive justice and re you know, re regaining the right that was taken away. Many of us um, are socialists and communists, but not everyone is, and that's okay. So we can work across issues where we make our, like, we're the political red thread through the issues that makes us, you know, that, that's what separates us from the NGOs is we have a political horizon there. And in fact, we pretty much share it. Cause I mean, I actually think it would be a pretty great world if the political system was socialist and communist arguing with each other. It's like, oh, okay, we've got the economy taken care of. That's done. Now, now we can, you know, or, um, argue about Kronstadt or something like that, or, you know, historical things. But, but I really, I think that recognizing the strength, recognizing the agreement that we have and maybe building from that in our parties, like uh, one thing, and I'll finish with this, Julia, you ask, where do we see work? You know, I'm a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation, and I joined this party because I was completely impressed with the the leadership of so many um, young people and people of color and their learning from an older generation of activists who are bringing years and decades in the struggle and that combination 
of young people um, with an amazing street game and then the knowledge of people with decades of experience is just is just inspiring and um you know and i think something yeah it's something to point to that's positive in the movements right now thank you so much jody thank you for your contributions tonight we'll go ahead and hear closing remarks from cliff yeah um so i'll just close by practicing some comradely disagreement uh for all of us to see <laughs> And showcase it. Um, I, I disagree with something that Jody had mentioned, although I think we actually agree. I wish you could respond, but it's closing remarks <laughs> on the substance. Um, but something that she had said was, uh, you know, we know there's not a democratic road to revolution and to socialism in the United States. I think that there absolutely is. And this is part of what I had talked about in our talk in Chicago, in that I, I believe that uh, democracy uh, specifically Lenin's view of democracy, which I hold to, uh, includes the suppression of violent reactionaries who are trying to establish minority rule. You cannot have democracy without that. And if I understood the comrade correctly, it seems she kind of counterposed that, that suppression to democracy. I don't think you can have democracy without that suppression. Uh, I think that's absolutely part of the process. Uh, what we have here today in the United States, many people call that a democracy. It is not. It's the furthest thing from it because violent minority rule is enshrined in law by the United States Constitution. Uh, and we can't get around that as long as we're working within the bounds of it. Um, so in order to have a democracy where we live today, we're going to have to abandon that you know, ruling document and embrace a definition of democracy that does not include, for instance, uh, letting Nazis have marches where they talk about how they want to kill us. Uh, so I, I do think we agree on, on the substance of this, um, but I, I would like to have more discussion uh, about what is democracy, you know, what, what's, what would we call a democratic action or not a democratic action. Um, we could use Lenin as an example of that counterposing state and revolution, the writing there to what actually happened in the Soviet Union. Um, so I'll, I'll just close with that. Thank you so much, Cliff, for that demonstration of comradely debate. I think that Lenin would be proud, and I hope we find ourselves in another forum at another time where we can all expand, expand more on that idea. We'll hear briefly from Linda, and then we'll move on to Paul. Thanks. Yes, um, there were just two points I wanted to make that that, that I think are, are, are relevant. Uh, following the Arab Spring and events in Egypt and even in the Black Lives Matter movement and other, other things uh, going on in, in the United States, uh, I read an article that hailed the role of social media and technology to rapidly bring people into the streets. And it's true, it's even powerful. But then it raised the question, what happens after everybody's connected and comes out into the streets. And what, what, what else does it take to sustain protests? And I would argue, what else does it take to actually build organizations that will go on to, to tackle the big tasks that we're talking about that need to be done? And my belief, it sounds so simple, is that there's no substitute for the hard, direct, coordinated one-on-one -on -one movement building work of organizing the class and all oppressed. That means working together in person, it means attending meetings, it means building relationships and skills and connecting issue and formulating programs for the long range. I think that there's a big preoccupation with uh, what has been accomplished you know, tweeting and doing other kinds of, of work like that. But I think that we have to pay attention to this because it's in that way that we'll have more conversations like this one and figure out the kind of organizations we need to build. And finally, um, what we envision um, is nothing short of galvanizing a leadership of the broad masses of humanity to truly experience their humanity, their skills, the possibilities and enjoyment of life made possible by the advances of capitalism, only possible with the abolition of capitalism. And I leave that to the audience and the rest of us to dwell on. 
Thank you, Linda. And now we'll hear finally from Paul, who brought us all together tonight with this incredible new book. And thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to be in the same revolutionary party as everyone on this panel and then others as well. And we have differences, but that's going to be the revolutionary. There are going to be differences. And there's a lot of common ground, I think, uh, 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 more than we recognize. Um, you know, and uh, uh, so um, a couple of things were posed by Jody that I want to address also that, that's related to this. Um, and one is, uh, what is a cadre? What, what do we mean by cadre? <laughs> what the hell is that? Uh, and I want to define what I mean by it. And uh, uh, another aspect of uh, the question is, what's wrong with the contemporary left? <laughs> what's the problem? You know, and one aspect uh, Cliff touched on, you know, uh, well, yeah, let's uh, all do this one project that we agree on. Uh, but then, geez, we don't agree on much and the thing falls apart. Uh, I think that was a very good point uh, and important. But we have to be able to disagree, uh, as uh, Cliff and I are doing in the pages of Cosmonaut, by the way. That's an example of a discussion among people who disagree, and they're not trashing each other. And that gets to a deeper problem that I've seen on the Internet a lot, and not just on the Internet. Why is someone a revolutionary? Someone is a revolutionary to prove how pure they are. It's a moralistic thing, and they're defining their purity by your and everyone else's impurity, and they smash and trash other people to preserve their purity. And they're not revolutionaries from the standpoint of how do we make a revolution? How do we actually make a revolution? And that relates to the question of building cadre. Most people don't know how to organize a meeting in this country. Uh, a meeting that has an agenda that's clear and coherent, time limits, uh, and uh, uh, a meeting where people are able to be drawn to the meeting and they go out of the meeting understanding, yes, we've agreed on this and this and this, and then carrying it out. There are some people who have political experience in helping to set up such a meeting and the aftermath of such a meeting. How do you write a leaflet? How do you organize a demonstration? How do you develop a strategy getting from here to there, develop an analysis? What's our situation? What do we want to get to? How do we get from here to there? That most people don't have that. People who are developing that are cadre. They don't have an answer to everything, but they have an answer to some of the stuff uh, and some sense of how to function. And there's another key thing. They have a sense of building other cadre. It's not just us, the exclusive ones, the smart ones. It's everyone is getting drawn into the process of becoming an experienced, smart, savvy, revolutionary organizer. And then that's the kind of mass movement that you want. Uh, so in any event, that's a vision that I think I'm sharing with everyone on the panel, which is one reason why I want to be in the same party with you. Uh, and it's going to take some time. Uh, I'm hoping that we can have uh, additional forums like this and other venues where we can be sharing and discussing and developing and bouncing off of each other and disagreeing in ways that aren't stupid. You know, uh, uh, so in any event, this has been a pleasure. I hope uh, my book is is uh, as good as some people have been saying it is. I like it, but I'm prejudiced. Uh, but I'm hoping that it can contribute to the kind of process that we need to get out of the mess that we're in right now. So that's it. Thank you, Paul. And just a final thank you to all of our speakers tonight, Cliff Connolly, Jody Dean, Linda Lowe, and Paul LeBlanc. Um, and also a big thank you to all of the participants who watched along on the live stream. Everyone should go out and get this book and talk Lenin and live Lenin. So thank you and solidarity. Thanks. Bye-bye.